Good morning and welcome to this marketplace. I'm Claire Pierce and I'm your host for this session. Um, I work at the Sustainability Hub Low Carbon Devon Project um, here at the University, which is an ERDF funded project designed to support Devon enterprises on their low carbon journey. As you probably know already, having attended other marketplace sessions today, they are an opportunity for our speakers to showcase their work and our speakers come from a, a range of different backgrounds. Today in room one, we have two speakers. We have Professor Deborah Greaves and Professor Richard Handy, both from the University of Plymouth. Deborah and Richard both have 50 minutes for their presentations and then there'll be a few minutes after each for particular questions from you. So um, as they're speaking, please feel free to put your thoughts and also your questions into the chat. Um, so firstly, let me hand you over to Professor whose talk is entitled The Importance of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion for the Future of the Renewable Energy Sector. Okay, thank you very much, Claire. And good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining this session. Um, so, as Claire says, I'd like to talk about uh, ED&I, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, could you put the slides up, please, Millie? Thank you. Um, and uh, particularly about uh, what we've been doing in ED&I within the Supergen Offshore Renewable Energy Hub. I've just given a presentation in the earlier session um, about our Supergen Offshore Renewable Energy Hub, and this is a large programme of, of research uh, connecting together uh, academia and industry and policy around offshore renewable energy. But one strand of our work is to be uh, a beacon of um, a beacon for ED&I. So yeah, my name's Deborah Greaves, I'm Professor of Ocean Engineering here at the University of Plymouth and I'm the, the Director for the Supergen Hub. So our, our mission, if you like, for the Hub is to connect together, to provide a research leadership role and to connect together um, academia, industry, policy, public and to inspire innovation and research in offshore renewable energy in order to maximise its societal value and within offshore uh, renewable energy, we're including offshore wind, wave energy and tidal stream energy. But as part of our remit, which covers uh, many different areas, but one area is um, to be a beacon for equality, diversity and inclusion. And this is uh, because it's recognised that a lot of the uh, disciplines, well, in engineering and, and, and computing and so on, a lot of the disciplines are uh, have very low representation of females and also uh, low representation from BME community as well uh, and in particular in the energy sector uh, it's a very um, uh, there's there's a significant underrepresentation from these groups and this is something that's recognized and um, for the EPSRC they're very keen um, to uh, to see projects tackling this issue also within the uh, offshore wind sector deal so within the offshore wind uh, industry community is also something that's recognised and there's a target to increase representation. So for the hub, uh, what we want to do uh, in order to be a beacon, we want to look at our own uh, processes internally, implement best practice and externally to uh, through our interaction with other groups to try and raise uh, EDI, EDI more generally. As part of this, we started off by carrying out a scoping study, and this was done in collaboration with Aura, which is the uh, collaboration from the University of Hull, and um, Steffi. Study. Okay. And uh, this involved uh, a survey, a number of uh, structured interviews and so on, uh, with people in industry and uh, in academia. And you can find a link to that uh, scoping report. Um, sorry, let's just go back. Uh, through that scoping report, a roadmap towards positive change on our website. I'll put the, the link at the end, the Supergen website. So um, I, I wonder if we can have some, uh, part, some uh, audience participation here. Uh, if anyone would like to guess um, first of all, the uh, percentage of the offshore wind workforce that were female, that are female, that were female in 2018. Um, so what do you think the current, uh, the current status is? 
what sort of representation do we have uh, within the offshore wind sector for females and then also um, within engineering more generally. Please do put uh, any thoughts into the Q&A. Um, okay, well, the current status or the status in 2018, oh, sorry, we have got a, a guess there, 25%. It's actually 16%. And uh, that's in offshore wind workforce. And then in engineering more generally, uh, it's even fewer than that. And uh, I did my engineering degree um, many years ago. And I think the, uh, the proportion of, of uh, females on my course was about, I don't know, 15% or something. And I'm, I'm really horrified to, to say that even now it hasn't gone up. So if you look nationally, I think the average uh, proportion of, of females on engineering undergraduate courses is about 13% across all engineering disciplines. So it's really low and it's really struggled to, uh, to go up. Yeah, and there have been lots of uh, guesses in there. Thank you. Um, but yes, it's 16% in offshore wind sector and, uh, well, 10% or less in engineering. So uh, what do we do about this? Well, we need to set some targets and then uh, and then think about what, what we can do to try and encourage uh, this, this proportion to grow. So within the offshore wind uh, industry community, they set this sector deal. Uh, with government and the target there is to have a third of the workforce by 2030 and the stretch target would be 40%. So 33% by 2030 from 16% today, that's an enormous target. It's almost, um, it's, it's almost as ambitious as net zero by 2050, we could say. But anyway, um, then what about the BME community? What sort of representation do we have there? Anyone like to hazard a guess on this? What's the current status for, uh, first of all, for the offshore wind workforce, BME community proportion, um, and then also um, of engineers more generally. Um, so we've got 10% guess there. And yeah, so it's actually 5% um, in 2020 and in offshore wind. And slightly higher. Offshore wind deal also sets targets for this. Um, so by 2030, the target is to go to increase from 5% to 12%. So again, that's great to set the target, but how on earth do we get there? What's the track uh, that we need to follow? What's the roadmap? Um, so first of all, thinking about what is EDNI. So this is key. Equality is about it's a legal thing and it's about being uh, equal um, in terms of the uh, status, rights and opportunities. Diversity. It's about having people with different backgrounds, people who are different from one another uh, working together. The benefits of a diversity is that you get much more creative solutions. You get solutions and thinking which are much more likely to uh, to work, to be implemented successfully because they have a, a range and a, a wider range of voices um, deciding on them. And then it's all very well having diversity or in encouraging a diverse workforce, but you need to, uh, in order to maintain that and to sustain that, you need to make sure that people are included and feel included. So you also need to think about inclusion within your culture. So this is the uh, the action or state of including or being included. And uh, part of that might be sort of seeing yourself uh, as, as uh, part of that, um, that community. Um, as I said, the equality side of things, the, the Equality Act, that's a, a legal uh, obligation not to discriminate. This is a quote from uh, Juliet Davenport, founder of Good Energy. So um, the the climate and ecological emergency that we are facing at the moment is, is enormous and global. And uh, it's not something that one group of people alone can solve. And as we've seen from some of the earlier discussions, there are technological challenges, there are uh, societal challenges, and there are environmental challenges. And we need lots of brains uh, to think about this from very different perspectives. 
and part of the uh, we can't solve all of this by by science or by technology we need people to be involved so if people are going to be involved they need to be part of uh, making those uh, solutions so i think those people uh, creating the solutions uh, need to represent the community that then is going to use those solutions. So what's the problem? Well, this is often expressed as the leaky pipeline. Um, the idea that through um, the uh, education stages and career stages, we see the underrepresented groups sort of dropping off at various stages. And so one way of tackling the EDI shortfall or the um, representation shortfall rather is to think about what interventions can be done at each stage of the leaky pipeline. So if we think about primary school, then it's 51% uh, females uh, engaged across the whole sector, uh, the whole um, step, the whole discipline areas. Secondary school that goes off because uh, for whatever reason, females do less uh, STEM, fewer STEM GCSEs. That goes down further at A-level stage, um, at engineering degree stage, in the ORE industry, and then at senior roles. So at each step in this leaky pipeline, uh, we see the engagement of females, particularly in, um, in STEM or in ORE um, industry, as a dropping off. And so here on the green arrows, we've got a few interventions that could be made at each, at each level um, to think about um, trying to reverse the trend of uh, people dropping out or females particularly dropping out. Um, so things like uh, thinking about the, the language, decoding of recruitment and, and language around teaching and curriculum, um, thinking about using blind recruitment um, setting up networks and mentors for more senior staff uh, in order to um, in, in order to make sure that we don't lose uh, the people coming in earlier on, perhaps uh, after maternity breaks and that sort of thing. So really thinking about inclusion. Um, so within this report, there's a, a recommended action plan. Um, so for the short term, thinking about having discussions, talking about EDI, to understanding what it is and why it's important, thinking about job adverts and language around um, um, job opportunities and also career progression and, and degree courses, thinking about the language and the images that we put out there, and then championing, um, talking about and championing EDI at events and conferences. In the medium term, we can encourage networks. Networks are very supportive. Um, working with groups together, so collaborating with others who also have EDI targets, thinking about mentoring and implementing rent mentoring, going right through to the early stage, coordinating work into primary schools and uh, ensuring that communications and language reflects EDI. Um, and then in the longer term, uh, further recommendations there. And I'm just going to go through a little bit more quickly um, because we, we've got some specific ones I want to come on to. Um, OK, so I think there's a real opportunity for the ORE research community uh, because it's quite a new sector and for the industry because it's a new sector. So we have an opportunity to make sure that we address EDI uh, from the outset. It's also an area where we really do need to have different disciplines working together. Um, so within the Supergen hub, what we've done is we've set up a charter, an EDI charter, which sets out um, our aims, scope, responsibilities, and so on. And we've encouraged our team and also our industry advisory board and also our wider community to sort of uh, agree and to, and to endorse those recommendations within the charter. We also have um, an EDI strategy which um, aims to embody best practice within what we do and to also influence the wider ORE community. And to think about this in all levels of our communications. So what have we done? Well, within our conferences and uh, our events, we always make sure that we have open EDI discussions as part of that. We make sure that we have um, uh, diverse panels um, we have carried out a survey of the members of the renewable energy community around EDI, particularly the impact of COVID on EDI, because we know that's been uh, in, in, in equal. Um, 
And we monitor the attendance and feedback and EDI for our attendees at events and workshops. And uh, yeah, that's also saying that. Then in the medium term, uh, we have a particular, we, we've got a um, EDI subgroup, which is a number of people across academia and industry who have joined a, a subgroup for, from our advisory board to, to discuss these issues and how we're tackling them. Um, we have, um, we are piloting reverse mentoring. So what we mean by reverse mentoring is that we have uh, senior people working alongside early career researchers and it's reverse mentoring because both parties learn something from the other. So it's not just about the ECR, the early career researcher learning from the senior academic, the senior academic or industry person will also learn a lot from the early career researcher. So it's a really important uh, idea, the reverse mentoring. Um, then outreach to schools and young and young people. So part of this is if you look at that leaky pipeline, we see people uh, drop it or females dropping off as we go through the pipeline. What we need to do is to inspire children and their parents and their influences at a very early age. Um, so what we've done is we, we, have an, we have outreach activities that we run. We have a mini wave tank that we've taken around to things like the, uh, um, the Green Man Festival, Einstein Field and engage with many, many families. Um, we're also uh, developing a children's book, which is aimed at very early age, uh, sort of three to six, uh, early readers reading with their parents or grandparents. And then targeting the teenage audience, we're also running a competition at the moment to develop an app, a games app in uh, offshore renewable energy. Um, okay, and then in the longer term, um, we uh, we think about the timing of our events, thinking about school holidays and, and also international participation. Uh, we record and live stream all our events. Of course, we're all doing that now, but we uh, we we started doing that before we had to, and uh, certainly we would something we want to carry on with because it's very uh, inclusive, and. Um, uh, we consider the timing of our calls and make sure that there's enough time for people to uh, put the applications together. And we also have a, a double blind review process. So when we, we've we allocated um, three million pounds in, in research funding through the Supergen Hub. And in as our uh, assessment for that, we have uh, reviewed the proposals entirely um, anonymized. Uh, at the first stage, so we're really just looking at the quality of the application before we then start to look at the um, at the research team and their, their 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 skills and capability. Okay, and the other thing I wanted to mention that we have all uh, also uh, given our um, our director team the uh, the un unconscious bias training as well as part of that. Okay, so that's that's what I wanted to say today, and I, this is a an extremely important area for uh, well for all of us, of course, but um, particularly when we're thinking about designing the the solutions, the technical solutions for the future in and in energy, it's something that is extremely important for all of us and will be um, uh, used by all of us. So we need to make sure that everyone is involved in those solutions. If you want to find out more about um, our Supergen Hub and find and read the report. That's all there. The links are on the website. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. Thank you very much, Deborah. That's great. So we've had a few questions coming in. Um, the most recent one is at the bottom there. So EDI matters are still being discussed by mainly white people. How can this be addressed? So that's the not the female side, the ethnicity side. Yes, absolutely. And that's um, that's a good point, but we uh, within the Supergen we have um, linked up with, and actually also within uh, the CCAM, our school in in, in Plymouth, um, we have linked up with the AFBE, which is the Association for BME Engineers, and uh, they've worked with us at our at our uh, assembly, which we ran in January for the Supergen. They were involved in that on the panel. Um, talking about ED and I, and uh, where hope, where as I say, we've we've joined up this year as a school, so we'll be working with them very much, and hopefully getting some uh, input from them on how we can really address this. 
um, I think it's a it, it's a very good point. Um, and I think you know in in Plymouth uh, and at the university, our um, representation from BAME is also quite low. So it is important to get um, to get representation on the panel discussions. I would agree with that. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. Another question has just come in about unconscious bias training. And the question from Alan is, how does it work? Uh, has had a mixed reception. How does it work? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's very useful to to have unconscious bias training, which is targeted on a particular um, activity or or, um, uh, or or event or whatever uh, or, um, or for a particular reason. I think. Otherwise, it can it, it can have a mixed reception. I agree. Um, what we did as the Supergen is we ran a specific unconscious bias training around um, assessment of proposals. So we were allocating out you know a significant amount of research funding. So we wanted people to really think hard about their uh, their unconscious bias, which of course we all have, and what that means and how we should. Uh, work as a team to to challenge that and be aware of it, um, and so that was very targeted around that activity, which I think was helpful. Mm, stops it being just a, a vague approach, but actually specific. Mm. Okay. Um, one question came up when you were speaking about the value of marketing and the advertising sector, which you actually then addressed by saying, you know, using images so people can project themselves into a career. Is there anything particular that you'd like to sort of expand on with that? So the use of marketing, advertising, and that almost personification of a person in a role. Yeah, I think it's very important to be able to see yourself in that role. Um, I think it's also important to, so, so yeah, having those images is, is correct. They also need to be genuine and authentic. So using stock images um, is, is difficult because it's, all, it's always quite clear that they are. Um, so if it's possible to have real, uh, real images and real active, you know, that, that's great. Uh, the language is very important. We need to think carefully about the language in, uh, in advertising and in talking about our, our courses and our programs. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of very, very useful, uh, very helpful information from organizations like AFBE and WISE, which is Women in Science and Engineering and the Women's Engineering Society and Engineering UK. Uh, many of these organizations put out um, some very useful information about the sort of language and how you can decode, gender decode uh, um, adverts and so on. Um, and just, you know, uh, recognizing that engineering is a massive area. It has a huge number of, it, it spans a really broad discipline and the people who will need to be working in the engineering uh, careers of the future need to have a really wide range of attributes uh, and knowledge it's not just it's not just physics and maths you know the 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 technical solutions need to be used by people <laughs> and so you need to understand people and people need to uh, you know it, it, it's a much broader than just the, the technology in, in the way it, sometimes it's presented so i think Absolutely. if we can if we can um try and uh, uh yeah, use language, images, and uh, even the activities that we run for for children at um, young ages to try and get across the, the very broad nature of um, of engineering and offshore renewable energy. <laughs> and the excitement and the relevance mm. of it. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions. Um, so thank you very much, Deborah. Um, I'll now move on to our next speaker. So we also have Professor Richard Handy here today. And Richard's talk is entitled Using Nanotechnology to Solve the Climate Emergency. So Richard, I'd like to welcome you to the room and I'll leave the room. Thank you. Your presentation. Okay. Hopefully you can see my slides. Could you see my presentation? Just checking with Millie behind the scenes. Yes, I can't see the screen anymore. You got it in full screen mode, Richard. Yes, I'm in full screen now. I can see my slides, but I can't see you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Are we okay? So no, we can't see them yet. Um, I think press F5. Uh, okay. Let me try again. Just uh... there we go. Okay. So we're in your pool. Okay, I've lost you now, Richard. Okay, got Richard, now we need presentation. Everybody just talk among yourselves, please, that'd be great. Deborah, sorry, I know you're still on the call. Would you be able to stop your screen sharing, please? How's that looking now, Millie? Richard, are you able to... Oh. Richard, will you ever start talking without your presentation? Would that be possible? Oh, now we haven't got, oh dear. I Maybe mean, we haven't got any sound with Richard now. Sorry, everybody, please bear with us. Just a few technical issues. Okay, Richard, if you could refresh your screen now. and then full screen share. Okie dokie, I think we've lost Richard now for a moment. Um, does anybody want to put anything else in the chat? Regarding um, Richard's area of work or the EDI side that Deborah was talking about. Okay, please bear with us. We've now got two technical people on the call, which is fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Just to let you know, I don't want to lose any of you, but you can swap between sessions if you want to. So if you wanted to pop out of this session and go to another one for a couple of minutes while we just get Richard back online, please feel free, but do please come back to us. And please remember it will be recorded so you can view it later. Hi, Richard. Fantastic. Nice. I can hear you as well. It's even better. You can hear me. Okay. Nice. Good. And you can see the slides now? 
I can't yet, but I'm sure they'll be there any minute. Millie and Katie are working hard behind the scenes. Richard, are you have you shared your entire screen or have you just shared the window? So if I go to share screen, application window, and just can my you, PowerPoint. Can you share the entire screen, please? So the first one, and that should solve it. Okay. Uh, share screen. Click on the thumbnail of the screen. Entire screen. Yeah. Share. And then if you can put, open your PowerPoint, pop it in uh, slideshow mode. Perfect. There we go. Okay. And you can hear me? Yes. Right. Richard Handy will be talking about using nanotechnology to solve the climate emergency. I'll take it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Sorry about that little hitch. Uh, what I'd like to do is tell you about um, how we can use nanotechnology to to help solve the, the climate emergency. And uh, I, I guess we've seen already at the meeting that uh, there are lots of pressures on planet Earth. Um, the human population growth is uh, uh, an issue. Uh, habitable living space is becoming a problem. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot about food supply today already. Um, we've also got related issues around water security. And of course, there's disease, which you all know about now, of course, and uh, the pollution that, that's contributing to climate change as well. And um, so how can nanotech help with all these big problems that, that face the human population and, and, and the planet? Well, what exactly is nanotechnology and nanomaterials? Or well, nano comes from the Greek word havoc, meaning dwarf, and, and of course, nano is very small. Uh, but one technical definition of a nanomaterial is uh, a substance that's got at least one dimension less than 100 nanometers. And nanotechnology is simply the application of nanomaterials in products and processes. And it's fair to say that nanotech is fairly big business now, so it's worth you know uh, billions of dollars. And how big is a nanometer? Um, well, uh, you, we can imagine our, our thickness of our fingernail at millimetre scale, uh, a red blood cell at micrometre scale. And if we go down again, um, viruses are around about 100 nanometers. So, so nanomaterials are about the size of a virus or smaller, um, but they're bigger than the molecular size. So they're, you know, they're, they're bigger than, say, this double helix of, of DNA. And we work mainly with materials that are 40, 50, 60 nanometers in, in diameter. Well, I think it's also important to say that the world is full of naturally occurring nanoparticles. They come from many different uh, processes. Uh, forest fires, for example, generate nanoscale carbon soot that's, that's very evident in, in geological records. Um, volcanic activity produces an ultra-fine dust with nanoscale crystals and microscale crystals that go into the atmosphere. So we're living in a a nanoparticle rich uh, uh, world already. And, um, but since the industrial revolution, we've certainly contributed to the particulates in, in, in the air and in the soil and so on. And, uh, you know, um, the, the burning of fossil fuels, mining activities and so on are creating lots of nanoscale soots, which we call incidental nanomaterials that go into the environment. Um, but now engineers are making uh, new types of nanomaterials. We call these engineered nanomaterials or manufactured nanomaterials. Uh, and they come in many different chemistries. These are designed uh, on carbon-based structures. So we have carbon nanotubes that are single-walled or multi-walled. We have metals and metal oxides. Um, and we can also make composite materials made of several chemistries. So like these cadmium, selenium, uh, quantum dots here and we can also make nanomaterials in many different shapes and sizes so we have zinc oxide nanowires um, uh, and many other shapes that, that can be made and when we first started looking at the consumer products emerging on the market um, back in 2008 these were the sort of things that you you could find um, cosmetics vitamins sun creams and so on a few nano enhanced fabrics 
Um, nanomaterials were being used in industrial coatings and as fuel additives to clean diesel emissions from, from vehicles. And uh, that market's greatly expanded. Um, we can now also get antibacterial nano socks. Um, you buy food that where nano titanium is used as a whitening agent. We're using nanomaterials in, in paints, um, nanocarbon structures in aircraft design and building design, uh, and all sorts of medical applications, medical imaging, medical implants, and so on. So the market is greatly expanded. And there are lots of nanomaterials out there now, but how can they help with the climate emergency? Um, well, let's first of all take a look at this issue of living space. Um, we're, we're looking at overcrowding in, in our cities and, and poor quality uh, living space in, in, in some ur urban and rural areas as well. So how do we address those issues? Well, this is where um, civil engineering can help especially. And one aspect of nanotechnology is to make things like new types of concretes that have more compression strength and but greater flexibility. The carbon nanotubes that I mentioned a moment ago are 117 times stronger than steel but light. And these are opening the door to flat pack housing and other products like that. We can make materials corrosion resistant. We can make them waterproof. And the nano enhancements in plates um, um, mean that they stay white for longer. Um, they last longer. You don't need to repaint your structure so often. And we're hoping with all of these efforts, uh, nanotech can make a large low carbon footprint in in these building materials and also help move towards a, a neutral or zero emissions uh, uh, um, housing and here's one of my favorite examples in the uh, engineering literature self-healing concrete um, you know when the concrete gets cracked it releases uh, a, a nano material into into the uh, crack that, that then seals that and, and makes the material last longer so we end up with a more sustainable durable material what about food supply despite all the discussions we've had about food technology and, uh, uh, and, and, and the food chain today, we still are left with um, fatalities due to hunger being the main cause of, of human deaths on, on the planet. So we still haven't got, got this issue of food supply right. But how can nanotech help? Well, um, nanotech first emerged in, on the internet in health foods and mineral supplements but it's moved on a lot since then. Uh, we're using nanotech as agents in food manufacturing to improve the manufacturing processes. We're using nanotech and encapsulation technology for food ingredients and also for agrochemicals such as pesticides so that they're more targeted on, on crop production. And, uh, and so this is improving soil quality and, and food production. We're also looking at food packaging and labeling, making lighter, stronger materials so the transport of foods are easier to do, uh, better labeling, smart labeling so that the foods are safer. And we're also looking at drinking water technology in, in the food sector. I'll come on to that in a second. There are lots of reports out there from different government departments on nanotech on food, and, and you can certainly look at those from America and Europe and elsewhere. Uh, they, they make interesting dialogue about, about the way forward with our food. And um, in terms of the, the, the water issues, well, a couple of my favorite examples are the use of zero valent ion nanoparticles in groundwater. Um, groundwater contamination is a, a significant problem around the world and of course it's not accessible and, uh, and this technology involves injecting the, these iron nanoparticles into the groundwater where it reacts with the organic pollutants there, you know, the pesticides, herbicides and so on, breaks them down to, to, to CO2 and water um, and leaves the groundwater clean. Uh, there's also uh, some, some less high-tech approaches. These drinking water straws here have got nanotech filters that enable this water to be cleaned as you drink it. And most of the aid agencies uh, buy these filters now. And, and you know, they're about 10 pence each to produce. Well, what about um, disease and fighting uh, illness? Nanotechnology is used in three main areas. 
um, in the detection of new disease, so new sensors and detectors and measurement methods, uh, new treatments, so these are new medicines, uh, for example, and, and we're also thinking about preventative medicine and, and ways of stopping uh, disease emerging in the first place. And if you look at the uh, nanometrins being produced, for example, a big chunk of those are uh, to do with, with cancer, um, pain relief, uh, but also infection control. Uh, and, and of course, we, we've been looking at uh, that particular aspect in, in, in our work at Plymouth. And here's an example of uh, antibacterial nanomaterials. Um, the, this is electron micrograph teeth up the top here. You can see the bacterial growth on your teeth. So this is 24 hours of not cleaning your teeth. That's the bacteria that are there. And if you add nano silver to the surface of your teeth, you can stop all that bacterial growth. So nano silver is a, is a good biocide, but it's also quite safe uh, for, for us. And um, so we have all these benefits of nanotechnology that can help in uh, the, the climate sector with all these different problems. But of course, with every new technology comes worries and hype about that technology. And Prince Charles um, made a comment at an environmental conference, and it was an off-the-cuff comment to a, a reporter about um, nanobots uh, forming a grey goo and taking over the planet and, and the next day it was on the front page of the newspapers well um, I'm glad to say there aren't any nanobots and there, there isn't going to be a grey nano plague that takes over the world um, and some of the other stuff on the internet about you know military and other applications of, of nanotech are, uh, are, are not correct um, so um, there, there are lots of benefits of nanotechnology but we do need to consider the risks and uh, for us at Plymouth in our research we're thinking about safe responsible innovation and our, our research has two focuses making nanomaterials safe for the environment and safe for human health so that they they can be used in all these different applications to solve these these big problems that we face um, but we also need to think ahead about where technology is going and uh, we start our research, of course, with very good intentions about making better crop production and better medicines and so on. Um, but we need to keep an eye on that new technology. And let me give you an example of that thinking. One activity in our research is to develop nano enhanced medical implants. We're making uh, a titanium alloy um, medical implants uh, coated in nanomaterials that allow human tissue to grow over them. We're doing this for wound healing. But um, I guess you've heard somewhere else of human tissue living over a metal endoskeleton. And you might think of this fellow. And of course, if we go down that road with this technology, it could be bad. It could be very bad indeed. Um, so we need to think about the road ahead. And um, that's not the only example with nanotech. There's a lot of interest in neuroscience and engineering with nanotechnology, and, and this has produced new fields of, of science. One of those is brain-computer interfaces. Should we be going down this road with new technology? And who's keeping an eye on, on the science and, and where that science is going? Well, that brings us on to the topic of stakeholder engagement and stewardship of new technology. And um, I think this is very important for nanotech that we get the, the, the benefits of the nanotechnology, but we keep an eye on where that technology is going. But if you want to read about the stewardship of new technology, I'd recommend this, uh, this new book by Andrew Maynard um, about our rising futures of, of new technologies and how we can manage them. And, um, uh, and, and I also engage with the public on that in a, in a slightly different way. Uh, like Andrew, I, I write books as well, um, but also I write uh, novels. And, and the idea behind that was to, to engage with new technology in a different way so that we engage with different groups of the public and different stakeholders. And in my no novels, I'm using a science and technology premise to, to tell a nice story, um, entertainment, but, but get across a scientific message as well. Um, so... Um, you know, custodianship of, of new technology is important as well as the, the benefits of it.
Um, so I'd like to stop there, and, and if you've got any questions, we, we, we can perhaps take a, a discussion. Thank you, Richard. That's great. So we've got one question here in the feed um, from Eleni. She said that she investigated carbon nanotubes 10 years ago whilst doing her degree. At that time, yep. cost was a major obstacle in their application. So mm. are they now more economically flexible? Uh, sorry, feasible? Yes, yes, they are. Um, um, the, the cost of making nan nanomaterials has, has decreased a lot in the last decade. And, um, you know, you can buy kilograms of this stuff for a few pounds now. So, um, you know, in terms of those engineering materials and, and making things with with nano carbon structures, it's it's now much more affordable. Uh, and actually, we're finding that adding a, a few percent of a carbon nanotube to a you know a concrete mix or some other structure can greatly increase its uh, mechanical and tensile properties um, at quite low cost. Um, okay, so it's almost but, like partial use. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. And we've got a question from Andre White um, saying the use of nanotech for concrete is interesting. And is Plymouth University currently doing any research in self-healing concrete? Um, we're, we're not at the moment. Um, um, I am working with colleagues in the engineering department and we are looking at Portland cement and a few other materials. Um, um, so, so we are looking at some of those engineering materials and and we we think about the material first and then think about its application so so some of those applications might be in medicine some of those might be in civil engineering some of those might be in the uh, food and water sector so that's interesting so rather than looking at what's needed and then producing yeah. the material you're looking at the material and then where it can be applied yes yeah and and one of the nice things about nanotechnology is that the um, the innovation is 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 there and it's moving quite rapidly so companies are producing materials and then looking for a market for the product and an application for the product and, um, and so so instead of coming with a problem and looking for a material we've got materials lo that are looking for applications fantastic great well thank you very much um sorry about the technical problems earlier yeah. but we are now just wrapping up with one minute to go so okay thank you We've got oh, one more one more question just come in um, or oh, from Max Coleman. What is the carbon footprint of nanomaterials, carbon nanotubes for building materials? <clears throat> um, I don't know the, the precise answer to that, but but the um, the manufacturers are making them but safe by design. And the the chemistry is it's fairly standard chemistry to make them. And the materials are very durable. And compared to other, you know, compared to say making a plastic or something else, um, it's a much lower footprint. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much, Deborah. Okay. And thank you very much, everybody, for bearing with us. And um, see you at the next session. Please do keep putting information or your thoughts into the feed. And please look out for the discussion boards. Thank you. Bye.